Good morning, everyone. I'd like to convey a warm welcome to all of you participating in this Asian Impact Webinar organized by Asian Development Bank's Economic Research and Cooperation Department. It's our great pleasure today to present a new book, edited book volume, titled The Future of Regional Cooperation in Asia and the Pacific. Regional Cooperation Integration, or in short RCI, has been a cornerstone for Asia's economic growth and path to prosperity. And the challenges we are facing today calls for a renewed approach to the regional agenda. The pandemic has weighed heavily and disrupted Asia's cross-border flows and activities. In what follows, we will discuss how RCI, Regional Cooperation Integration, can help strengthen the region's economic resilience through regional cooperation initi initiatives. We have the honor to welcome impressive group of experts who will discuss the main findings of this volume and draw some lessons for the future of regional cooperation. I'm very pleased to introduce our distinguished keynote speakers today. First, I'd like to invite Mr. Dato Lim Jokhoi, Secretary General of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, who kindly agreed to deliver his opening remarks for this occasion through video. Let us please listen to the Secretary General's welcome uh, remarks. Good morning. It is indeed my pleasure to join you today for the online launch of the ASEAN Development Bank new book on the future of regional cooperation in Asia and the Pacific. The book examines the state of the regional cooperation in Asia today and provides reflections on various issues. I would like to congratulate ADB, particularly the editors of the book, for their efforts. This book comes at a time when call for greater regional resilience have become more important than before amidst the current COVID-19 pandemic crisis. ASEAN is not immune to this global crisis, but as shown by our experience after the Asian financial crisis, regionalism can be a stabilizing factor when shocks arrive. This time, the stability of the region is being challenged again, but I am convinced that ASEAN will be able to withstand these challenges given that the region has grown more resilient, stronger and integrated than before. Quite fittingly, the book reaffirms the growing importance of regional cooperation and integration in Asia. The global economy continues to grapple with the economic and health crisis. In my view, only by working together and cooperating that, was, that we can get the global and ASEAN economies back on track. This is evidence in our collective response to the pandemic. Since the outbreak, ASEAN has managed to successfully contain the spread of the virus through our decisive efforts to go through this crisis together. As COVID-19 Response Fund is now operational, along with the Regional Reserve of Medical Supply and Regional Framework for dealing with future pandemics, a comprehensive recovery framework and its implementation plan are also in place to serve as our exit strategy, not only to overcome the virus, but also to recover and build back better. A number of key priorities were identified in the books, which include regional public goods, infrastructure connectivity, regional trade and investment, and financial cooperation. This resonate with the priority that ASEAN has set for itself to build the ASEAN community by 2025. This book reminds us of the tremendous tasks ahead of us in integrating the region and building our resilient future.
future. In ASEAN, I always believe that our strongest strength is our willingness to work together. I think the ability to address the region's development challenges will not be possible with a strong ASEAN commitment to regional cooperation and integration all these years. In fact, most of the regional public goods that we are now enjoying in ASEAN, such as the integrated market, harmonized standard trade facilitation initiative, joint investment regime, or regional funding, such as the Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization, were created out of a strong resolve in the regions to work together. The signing of Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, two weeks ago is another concrete evidence of the pow power of regional cooperation and how far it has served the regions well. As an ASEAN-led process, RCEP signified ASEAN ability to lead multilateral negotiation and our role in the provision of cross-border public goods in the form of a comp comprehensive, modern, high-quality and mutually beneficial trade agreements. Again, without the cooperation of all of these 15 countries, RCEP as the largest trading bloc in the world will not be here today. Moving forward, regional cooperation will never be the same again after the pandemic. The post-pandemic world is likely to be a more complex will be of greater interdependence among our economies. This means that more, not less, regional cooperation is needed. The future of regional cooperation will depend on our ability to manage three important issues in our regions today. First is the digitalization. Digital technologies have provided an important lifeline during the pandemic, particularly in keeping people and market connected and generating productivity improvement. Digital connectivity is becoming as necessary as sanitation, power or water for productive activities and people's well-being. There should be a greater awareness of digitalization and its critical role in the region's transformation. Second is addressing cross-cutting issue. The region is now faced with a growing number of cross-cutting issues such as the changing shift in technology, urbanization and demographic and connectivity with significant implication across countries and sector. Given a large number of cross-cutting issues in the region, having a strategic approach is crucial. We need regional solutions that are more focused, targeted and effective. Finally, is the need to promote sustainability in the region in all dimensions, from transition to clean energy to green infrastructure disaster management and sustainable financing. Evidence suggests that, that failure to address sustainability issue will have far more adverse impact to the regions than a pandemic. Therefore, the time for action is now. In closing, as Asia and ASEAN continue to play an increasingly important role in the, in the world, regional cooperation and integration is here to stay. The challenge, however, is how to make it more relevant and make it work better. I welcome ADB's call for an optimistic future for the region. ASEAN will continue to strengthen cooperation as we navigate a dynamic, resilient and inclusive future for Asia and the Pacific. I wish you all productive deliberations today. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Datrim Jok Hoi, uh, the Secretary General of ASEAN. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Bambang uh, Burodoyo Negoro, uh, Minister of uh, Minister of uh, uh, Research and Technology, and also Chief of a uh, National Research and Innovation Agency of the Republic of Indonesia. We will present Indonesia's experience on regional cooperation for innovation and technology. Um, unfortunately, due to a conflict in his schedule, uh, his key keynote address was also pre-recorded for today's uh, event. So, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Burodoyo Negoro. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Distinguished panels and the honorable participants of Book Loans Asian Development Bank. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It is a huge pleasure for me to be invited to this special occasion at the Book Loans Future of Regional Cooperation in Asia and Pacific. I would like to congratulate all the parties involved and I hope this book will provide insights for stakeholders to formulate an evidence-based policy. Indonesia has a vision to be a high-income country in 2045. However, currently, Indonesia is struggling to escape from the middle-income trap. Furthermore, Indonesia's economy depends mostly on the use of natural resources, which is limited and therefore needs to be left out gradually. It means that we need to shift into sustainable concept to reduce the use of waste as well as to give more added value to the Indonesia innovation products in order to push economic growth. This can only be done through the enhancement of technology and innovation. Shifting Indonesia's economic paradigm from resource-based to be innovation-based has to be supported by budget allocation. Currently, Indonesia only allocates 0.28% of GERD to GDP. The budget is dominated from the government sector around 85%. Therefore, to encourage the industry involvement to do research and development, the government launched the super tax deduction to give a gross income reduction up to 300% of the total cost incurred. The pandemic we are facing has affected our economic sector significantly. However, it drives the rise of a less contact economy which is characterized by hyperconnectivity among citizens using information and communication technology or ICT and enhancement of digital transformation. So, it is safe to say that this pandemic accelerates the digital transformation in Indonesia. In response to the pandemic until now, more than 61 products have been launched as a result of the triple helix synergy among researchers government, and industry. The synergy shows that with the strong willingness to collaborate, we can achieve good things together. Indonesia is now becoming one of the world's emerging economies, the Southeast Asia's largest economy, with a GDP of more than 878 billion US dollars, one of the highest growth among G20 countries. A market of more than 260 million people with a growing sizable middle class and a wealth of natural resources. As a member of G20 and with the blessing of Indonesian richness in biodiversity, as well as the future bonus of demography, Indonesia has continuously attracted many international partners. On the other hand, Indonesia also has delivered equal efforts in becoming the great partners for any international cooperation. All of the Indonesian ministries, R&D agencies, and universities have also provided resources and delivered great efforts in maintaining any mutual collaboration. Regional cooperation in ASEAN is getting stronger, especially with the spirit of ASEAN Economic Community, AEC, and ASEAN Socio-Cultural Community, or ASCC. I hope this is going to be a momentum to enhance our collaboration, particularly in the field of science and technology and innovation. We have established the ASEAN Plan of Action on Science, Technology and Innovation, or APASTI, 2016-2025. to 
where all the research activities among ASEAN has to refer to this plan of action. Several programs that become the main agenda are building the mechanism of technological transfer among startups, developing policy framework and guidance to strengthen the collaboration between researcher, policymaker, and industry to commercialize the innovation-based products, encourage the participation of researchers to do research collaboration with ASEAN members. Closing my remark, we believe that collaboration is very much needed in this unprecedented time. We hope that cooperation on science, technology, and innovation among ASEAN in the future will give mutual benefits for all of us. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Minister um, uh, Bambang uh, Brutoyo Negoro. Uh, now uh, let's uh, move on to the next um, activity of today's webinar. Um, uh, let me uh, invite um, uh, ADB uh, Vice President Dr. Bambang Santono and um, uh, ADB uh, Research Department, Regional Cooperation and Integration Division Director Dr. Sion Park for um, uh, their presentation of the book uh, for 20 minutes or so. Uh, briefly, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Dr. Bambang Santono. Um, uh, Dr. Santono is a Vice President of Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development of Asian Development Bank ADB. He is the first uh, Indonesian uh, uh, Vice President in his position. Uh, Dr. Santono is responsible for managing knowledge in ADB and coordinating research and studies on various topics such as energy, transport, education, health, finance, urbanization, and also cross-cutting nexus themes such as climate change, governance, gender, social development, environment, rural development, and food security and regional cooperation. He also coordinates ADB annual flagship publications such as Asian Development Outlook, Key Indicators of Asian Pacific, and Asian Regional Economic Integration Report, AEIR. Uh, Dr. Sion Park, also presenting, uh, uh, is uh, Director of Regional Cooperation Integration Division in the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of the ADB. In her current capacity, she manages a team of economists to examine economic and policy issues related to regional cooperation integration and develop strategy and approaches to support RCI. Uh, with that, um, uh, without further ado, um, um, I'd like to uh, uh, give floor to uh, Dr. Vice President Santono and uh, uh, Dr. Sion Park for the presentation book uh, for around 20 minutes. Uh, VP and Sion, floor, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chief Economist Sabada San. I hope that my audio is clear right now. Yes, uh, I can hear you and I can see you very clearly. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, a very good morning, uh, afternoon, and uh, evening, everyone. A very good day to all of you. Welcome again to this event. It is really a great pleasure for me to be part of this ADB Asian Impact Webinar today to, be, to present our new book on the future of regional cooperations in Asia and the Pacific. I would like to thank Minister Brojanagoro and uh, my dear colleague, Secretary General of ASEAN, Dato Lim, for joining this event. I'd like also to thank many colleagues, the contributors, whose insights and research made the book possible. While regional cooperation and integration, or we call it RCI, has helped anchor ADB work in the region for decades, it has never been more important than today. We have a challenging course ahead to navigate out of the COVID-19 crisis toward economic recovery. RCI is an essential component, and in rethinking these strategies, this book aptly brings renewed attention to the multiple issues on the RCI agenda. Its goal to help our members in the regions to continue working together to create an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable economy. So let me begin with a historical perspective on regional cooperation and economic development. In nearly half a century, the Asia and the Pacific regions has come a long way with regional cooperations, having served as one of the driving force behind its rapid growth and economic transformations. Over the past decades, development has surpassed expectations and in spectacular fashions. In 1980, for example, Asia's share of global GDP was 16%. By 2018, it had jumped to 33%. 
The region has done remarkably well by embracing openness, increasing international trade and foreign direct investments have played major roles in its transformations. Between 1980 and 2018, the regional share of trade to GDP rose from 34% to 53%, and growth in goods and services trade averaged 9.5% annually. Nowhere else can we see regional and global value chains more vibrantly at work today. Foreign direct investment to the regions has also been vital. Overall, inward FDI to Asia increased from 10% of GDP in 1980 to 28% in 2017, with Asia's share in global FDI inflows likewise growing substantially from 14 to 30 to 35%. The robust growth brought with it significantly higher living standards. Extreme poverty dropped dramatically from 68 to 7% in less than 40 years. Today, most economies in the regions have reached middle income status. All these accomplishments occur hand in hand with trade and investment agreements, technological cooperations, cross-border infrastructure projects, and the creations of regional institutions. Nonetheless, the region now faces unforeseeable challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic with notable disruptions to global trade, investment, and the movement of people. The pandemic has placed Asia regional partnerships on a new trajectory one that demands new coordinated actions to restore growth and stability. So what will regional cooperation look like in the future? This book explores several broad yet critical areas. First, investing in regional public goods or RPGs will be central in dealing with common challenges and maximizing the opportunities created. RPGs use collective actions to tackle challenges shared by neighboring economies and they spread benefit across the wider regions. For example, we have seen successful investment in cross-border infrastructure, regional trade agreements, regional financial safety nets, along with pollutions and disease surveillance and control. Second, in building strong regional trade and production networks, we need to ensure more inclusive participations from poor and disadvantaged groups. This will ensure gains are more equitably shared by building strong institutions that provide targeted support and by harnessing the opportunities from the ongoing digital transformations, we can trim some of these inequalities. Third, as ASEAN financial markets have become increasingly open and interconnected, greater financial cooperation is essential. The region should continue deepening its financial sector and capital market while it boosts cross-border financial flows it should also ensure that systemic risk is contained by strengthening financial resilience. Strong regulatory and supervisory framework, deeper alternative sources of market financing, and stronger financial safety nets are crucial parts of this strategy. Fourth, stronger, stronger regional cooperations is a key element in tackling emerging challenges with transnational implications. This includes regional health security and infectious disease control, supporting ocean governance and the blue economy, and encouraging countries to embrace low carbon technologies. So ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, the challenges we face today are unprecedented, but we can transform this into opportunities by seizing the potential of regional cooperations. These past months have demonstrated the importance of working closely with our government counterparts and other partners to prepare for a renewed form of globalization, one that allows our regions to remain an engine of global growth and make progress toward achieving the sustainable development goals. We hope this edited volume will contribute to this effort. So let me now hand over to Dr. Sin Jong Park, who is my co-editor, to continue the presentations and provide an overall summary of the book. Thank you very much. Thank you, VP, for providing this uh, great overview. I'll now um, discuss the, each part of this uh, volume. Uh, first is the regional public goods, or RPGs. With growing economic interdependence and integration, the region is facing development challenges that are increasingly transnational, such as cross-border connectivity, 
financial contagion, climate change, and natural hazards. The RPGs create benefits beyond national borders and require collective actions to implement. Adequate provision of RPGs creates regional spillovers that generate greater benefits than any individual nation can do unilaterally. However, since it requires collective actions, RPGs can be promoted much better when individual countries are aware of the full benefits and aligned with national development challenges. It is also important to clearly identify and measure the benefits. RPGs are essential for tackling common development challenges facing the region. The states must be providing the national public goods first. In fact, uh, regional policy cooperation for regional public goods can also supplement and complement national and global efforts. Successful examples of RPGs can include cross-border infrastructure, energy transmission and trading, regional trade agreements, health protocols for elimination of communicable disease or harmonization of intellectual property rights. These examples have also taught us that in many cases, policy intervention is needed to address gaps and create spillovers. A deeper understanding of the shared benefits from RPGs can create incentives for future regional cooperation. There are two general approaches to quantify RPGs. First is the input approach. Here, we measure the inputs and to produce and preserve RPGs as a proxy for their total value. For example, the, uh, we can have the uh, sum of all official development assistance to developing countries or the total number of international treaties. Second is the output approach. Here, we measure the we try to measure the full RPG benefits, including the cross-border spillovers. For example, we can employ some economic models in uh, empirical methodologies for uh, benefit-based total uh, RPGs. Together, these uh, help uh, improve the valuation and assessment of RPGs. In addition, we need to understand how one country's contribution affects overall RPG provision, depending on a type of RPGs. This helps policymakers to find the most appropriate way to provide for RPGs. Let me just give a few examples. First, summation. This is when the sum of each nation's contribution constitutes the overall supply of an RPG. Here, the example can be uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The more countries participating and contributing to emissions reduction, the benefit will be greater for all in terms of climate change and mitigation. So the policy intervention should focus on preventing free riding. The second example can be a weakest link aggregation. This is when the smallest contribution by the most vulnerable determines the available RPG for all. A good example would be the prevention and control of communicable diseases. In this case, policy intervention should focus protecting and then assisting the most vulnerable countries. And then third is a best shot uh, aggregation. This is when the largest contribution by the leading country determines the available level for all. And this is uh, really timely as the best example would be the vaccine development. And in this case, 
policy support should be better dedicated to the leading country, which, <clears throat> which have both the commitment and ability to make a difference. These examples are providing just an overview of how many different uh, structures the RPGs can take and how RPGs can observe the individual contributions and provide um, gener gen generate different outcomes. And this is a critical to consider these RPG design and implementations. We need to support RPGs to help Asia meet the targets of sustainable development goals. One of the targets in SDG 1 on uh, zero poverty is seeking to build resilience of the poor and reduce vulnerability to climate related extreme events or other disasters. Regional cooperation on communicable disease contributes to SDG 3 on health and well being, and cross border trading in energy can enhance access to sustainable energy in SDG 7. Overall, RPGs are already contributing to a wide range of SDGs. We turn to trade and investment now. Open trade and investment have been a key driver for growth and poverty reduction in Asia, but gains have not been evenly distributed. The second key aspect to consider for future of the regional cooperation is to turn trade and investment more inclusive. The region have made significant progress in reducing trade costs through domestic and cross-border connectivity and institutional reforms. We have also seen how global initiatives such as A for Trade and WTO trade facilitation agreements can help developing countries improve trading conditions, particularly when resource and capacity constraints are major impediments. In this edited volume, we examine two specific areas where we can enhance inclusive growth. First is how to uh, help the multinational enterprises attract the uh, global value chains and how the institutional factors that drive the inward foreign direct investment can be promoted. So the paper presented in this uh, volume actually find the evidence to show the presence of multinational uh, enterprises affiliates in Asia contribute to uh, contribute to its uh, engagement uh, in global value chains and have a positive spillovers in trade and playing an important role in attracting the direct investment. These findings suggest that we need to look beyond a traditional role of multinationals to more complex and nuanced function in Asia's trade and uh, production uh, capacity building. Another study also presents evidence that the quality of government and institutions play a very important role in attracting foreign direct investment. This is irrespective of any entry mode, whether it's a greenfield or through mergers and acquisition or the income levels of the source or host economies. Particularly, multinationals from high income countries seem to be more responsive to local governance quality, a favorable business environment in host economies and existence of regional trade agreements seem to encourage investment flows, especially through greenfield investments. To sum up, Asia and Pacific can successfully use trade to drive growth and promote development. As the region faces a new global trade landscape post pandemic, deepening trade investment and value chain would be more valuable than ever. So how do we help this? First, is to enhance resilience for new phase of globalization. To do this, the countries can diversify trade and investment channels, promote greater digital trade and paperless 
trade facilitation to support hard hit sectors, especially in, uh, in tourism. Second, we need to have a stronger regional cooperation to build resilient trade infrastructures. This includes enhancing resilience of connectivity infrastructure, harmonizing regional health and safety protocols, and investing in regional health infrastructure. And thirdly, reforms need to be accelerated Hello. Uh, I, I guess um, uh, there is a technical uh, uh, technical uh, uh, constraint. So I think a technical glitch. So, so I think uh, we can uh, probably uh, because uh, uh, Dr. Sion Park is wrapping up her presentation. So I can uh, briefly uh, summarize, and uh, we can move on to the uh, panel uh, uh, next panel. Um, I really thank VP and uh, uh, Sion um, uh, for um, this very, very insightful presentation and also overview. Uh, also, the very last part is uh, truncated, but I think she was wrapping up. The message was very clear. Um, presentation overview, uh, the range of uh, regional cooperation integration issues ranging from uh, regional public goods, trade and investment, uh, benefiting all uh, through uh, regional cooperation integration, also financial cooperation, has been a very important pillar of uh, RCI in Asia. And then um, uh, right now, uh, and also looking forward, building a resilience for disaster and climate change seems to be very, very uh, critical. Uh, Sion, are you, are you back? Uh, yes, I think, uh, so she was trying to show um, uh, financial cooperation um, uh, especially ASEAN plus three framework in the region has been a very, very uh, critical uh, to provide uh, in providing a financial safety net in the region and also uh, building resilience again, uh, disasters, including a pandemic, but also other uh, uh, you know, typhoon, hydrometrical disasters, and also geological disasters such as earthquake and uh, typhoons and broken eruptions. These uh, very, very um, uh, already emerged um, uh, threat to the uh, development. So I think uh, building up a resilience through regional cooperation integration is very critical. And also medium and longer term, um, uh, tackling a climate change, uh, both the mitigation and adaptation. Uh, because of by nature, climate change is really um, uh, involving a cross-border spillover, negative spillover effect. So I think um, uh, collaborating across the national border is very, very important. So regional cooperation integration, um, uh, disaster and critical uh, climate change are uh, really uh, important uh, uh, issue. Uh, and then uh, uh, in the area of uh, climate change, broadly speaking, uh, now uh, ocean health and blue economy, uh, this became a very, very important issue in the last uh, uh, couple of years. So ADB also uh, has been uh, helping um, uh, so-called blue economy initiative, um, uh, our uh, uh, member countries um, uh, coordinating through a regional cooperation integration network in this ocean health and blue economy issue. So I think, uh, okay, this is the end. So thank you, thank you very much again uh, for a um, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Actually, indeed, uh, this book has uh, 640 pages. So we are very lucky to be able to capture the main punchlines of the book within such a short time. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, VP and Sion. Uh, as reflected in this uh, publication and also presentation, Asian Pacific region has made a very remarkable progress um, uh, in uh, improving uh, living standards uh, for millions of people in the region and um, uh, poverty reduction was really uh, amazing. And uh, at the same time, uh, COVID-19 we're facing, facing right now, exposed the social and economic vulnerability for the region. So this new phase of regional cooperation after the pandemic uh, should ensure uh, these, uh, our past gains will continue and also uh, more broadly and evenly distributed. So one thing I'd like to mention about RCI is uh, uh, ADB has been putting RCI as a priority and will continue uh, to set RCI as one of the pillars. Uh, and uh, 
uh, two years ago, ADB said strategy 2030, next 10 years of strategy, seven priority areas. RCI is uh, one of the seven uh, pillars. And um, uh, from the earlier stages of pandemic, ADB has responded to provide support to developing member countries. For example, ADB has ensured continuity of a supply chain for especially for medical and uh, agricultural goods in the region through a trade fin finance supply chain finance uh, program. So this is a way, uh, one important area ADB continued to support uh, even during the pandemic. In the health arena, ADB has supported sub-regional frameworks, including ASEAN, to intensify regional cooperation on COVID-19 and vaccine uh, security. So this is really a um, uh, current, um, uh, you know, um, ongoing, uh, very, very uh, important challenge. And also uh, ADB has been and will be uh, contributing. Uh, RCI brings a common vision for providing connectivity, expanding regional uh, trade and creating regional public goods. So uh, I think uh, this is um, uh, important. I, I'd like to recap uh, again. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, let's move on to the panel discussion. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce a panel of very, very high level experts uh, on this uh, today's seminar. Uh, so our distinguished panelists, please kindly start uh, and uh, share your video. I'd like to uh, introduce. So our panelists, uh, uh, Mr. Haruhio. Uh, Haru, are you there? Yes. OK, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we can see your face and we can uh, <laughs> hear you. Uh, uh, Mr. Haruhio is uh, Arndt Professor of Southeast Asian Economies at the National uh, Australia National University. Uh, welcome, welcome, uh, Har. And um, uh, also, we, it's our great pleasure to have uh, Ms. Uh, Mia uh, Mikik, uh, Director of Trade, Investment, and Innovation Division at U U United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, UNSCAP. Uh, welcome, welcome, Mia. Thank you, Good thank morning. you very much. Yeah. Also, it's our uh, really great pleasure to have uh, Ms. Uh, Ji Kyung uh, Kang, uh, President and Dean of Asian Institute of Management, AIM. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ji Kyung, for um, uh, uh, joining. Uh, and uh, thank you, thank you very much, welcome. And also we have uh, Mr. Uh, Ronald uh, uh, Butyong, uh, uh, Chief of Regional Cooperation Integration Semantic Group, uh, uh, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department of Asian Development Bank. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Ronnie, uh, to joining today. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. So, uh, rest of time, we can have um, uh, hopefully two rounds or um, 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 uh, three rounds, and the third round, we can take uh, Q and uh, questions from the floor. So for the first round, I'd like to um, ask a specific uh, questions to each, each panelist, uh, starting from uh, uh, her. And um, uh, uh, please spend uh, five minutes or so uh, for your initial intervention. So Har, um, uh, first, I'd like to ask you uh, for your general feedback uh, to the presentation and this new edited uh, volume. Uh, you have seen uh, progress of regional integration in Asia very closely, particularly uh, regional cooperation integration in ASEAN. Uh, what are, in your view, the key reforms uh, that will impact most on regional cooperation integration in ASEAN in the next decade? Um, uh, probably uh, you may want to share your broad perspective on uh, RCI uh, for the first intervention. Mm. Uh, th uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yasu. Nice to see you and hear you again. And good morning, uh, good afternoon where, from where I am. Good evening to other people. Uh, a special hello to Vice President Dr. Bambang uh, Susantono. Hello, Pat. And, and, uh, and also to Dr. Sinyan Park, uh, uh, to both of you. Nice to see you both. And congratulations to you both for this very impressive volume and to the chapter authors a volume of over 600 pages, and I think it will be very widely read and appreciated. Uh, a hello also to my distinguished uh, panelists, fellow panelists in the discussion. May I just say at the beginning, uh, start with an apology. At short notice, I had to undertake a road trip. And so I'm doing this presentation from the roadside in 
Southern Australia, Southern New South Wales. Uh, apologies, um, but I hope it's coming through okay. And owing to the miracle of internet and Zoom and other facilities, we can do this from almost anywhere, which is remarkable. Okay, so some general observations and maybe I'll come back with specifics uh, in the second round if there's time. So first of all, this is, this is a highly topical and, and very timely and a comprehensive volume. Uh, re regional cooperation and integration has been uh, the core business for the ADB for over, for over 50 years. And ADB has set the intellectual and policy agenda for work on this topic. In, in fact, it also came through very clearly in the seminal volume released by the ADB early, earlier this year on 50 years of Asia Pacific uh, development. Uh, along with that, uh, ASEAN has shown practically how a region formerly beset by misunderstandings and occasional conflict can be transformed by far-sighted regional cooperation and leadership. So to state the obvious, developing Asia is the world's most dynamic, has been the world's most dynamic region for several decades. Originally, of course, East and Southeast Asia, now, now spreading, especially to South Asia. And regional cooperation in its many forms, from the, uh, in, from the informal to the explicit and negotiated agreements, has underpinned this success. The, the, the general principle of this is clear enough. Like-minded countries can often move faster than having to wait for the entire global community to move on various, various cooperative measures. Uh, I find it useful to go back to sort of regional cooperation 101. I find it useful to think of economic cooperation and integration as taking three principal forms, briefly multilateral, unilateral and regional and bilateral. The building blocks I think always start with unilateral. That is, reform at home is almost always the most important building block to think about these issues. Uh, next comes multilateral, and that, that is the rules of the, the global rules of the game, especially under the auspices of the World Trade Organization. And because that's important because it gives countries the confidence to, to proceed with reform at home in the knowledge that other countries are similarly doing these kind of activities. Now we know this environment is a creature of the post-war North Atlantic powers principally. And for several decades, it's been crucial to Asia's outward driven economic ex expansion. It is of course under threat, a point I'll come back to in a moment. Then regional cooperation and integration fits between these two core building blocks. Uh, that is the, 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 the unilateral and the multilateral. And it works best as it has in the Asia Pacific region if, if it's consistent with these two core building blocks, unilateral and multilateral. That is countries reforming at home in a supportive and conducive multilateral environment. Uh, so th I think the major challenge at the moment for the Asia Pacific region uh, is given the region's economic and political heft and powerful self-interest the, the countries not only pursue their own and regional agendas, but they, they uh, also engage with the world which is uh, with a, a world which is uh, which is a distressing level of what may be termed authoritarian populism. Uh, and the major challenge I think for the Asia Pacific community as much as is possible, is to take a global leadership role on, on these issues. Now, just briefly, if I may, let me just put three general issues on the table, then I'll perhaps come back to specifics later on if time permits. Uh, just three briefly, three, three general big picture issues as I see it. First of all, we can only pursue a liberal rules-based international order, including regional initiatives, if the domestic basis of the current global discontent are addressed. In particular, the rising intra-country socio-economic inequality, the rising sense of insecurity, the erosion of traditional bulwarks of social and economic support, such as full employment, universal egalitarian education, and so on. If, if these domestic issues aren't addressed, it's gonna be much more difficult to address the regional and global issues. Point two, uh, the World Trade Organization is crucial in this, as I mentioned, because it's the bedrock of any, any uh, regional uh, sub, you know, sub-global uh, economic and cooperation. The best, even the best regional uh, agreements are going to be undermined as long as the global system is verging on uh, disrepair. 
Uh, and of course, that applies not just to the WTO, but other global institutions, most especially at the moment, the World Health Organization. Th third and final general point is, I think, standing back from this important work, we have to be cognizant that the global economic and political order is changing quickly. And so we have to think how these initiatives fit into this rapidly changing uh, global order. For all its deficiencies, uh, the post-war era of US global dominance more or less worked for most of East Asia, uh, most of Asia, I'm sorry, as, as these countries opened up. However, we are not far away from the point where the world will be dominated by three superpowers, China, India, and the US, plus perhaps the EU, if it hangs together uh, still. So um, the US will have to become accustomed to sharing its global dominance in the context of a troika. Now, we know from elementary game theory that this is potentially an unstable equilibrium. And, and so it's going to be a huge challenge for far-sighted leadership to take a role. How these relationships among the troika in particular work out is going to be crucial, especially as at least two sides of the troika have uh, what can be, be at least described as uneasy relationships, sometimes very uneasy. Just one final note on that third point. Uh, in these projections, it's sometimes forgotten, this links back to the book, it's sometimes forgotten that in these projections, the fourth largest economy in the world will be Indonesia. Uh, it will be smaller than the big three, but it will be the fourth largest economy on these reasonably plausible projections. Since ASEAN is very important, indeed central to Indonesia's regional and global uh, economic and strategic uh, outlook, uh, ASEAN in turn will be central to thinking about these global issues. Uh, and that's where ASEAN, I think, has the challenge of, of elevating uh, its, 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 its uh, thinking and its issues to addressing these really uh, uh, important global issues. So thank you very much, Yasu. I will stop there and I'll look forward to coming back later on if time permits. Thank you again and congratulations to Pat Bambang and to Sinyang. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold, uh, uh, for really um, a nice um, um, uh, summary of uh, general uh, issues. Um, I uh, fully agree with you, uh, three points, um, uh, domestic um, issues of domestic stability, and then secondly, all the regional uh, initiatives and arrangement should be um, uh, nicely nested into a global, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, ultimate global system, uh, WTO and other uh, uh, areas. And uh, finally, a global uh, political uh, order or global governance. I think uh, we have a very uh, fruit, uh, entering a very fruit uh, situation, but I think at the same time, there are lots of opportunity for uh, ASEAN and we are now seeing uh, RCEP uh, sign. So I think uh, definitely we are observing um, uh, enhanced uh, critical role of uh, ASEAN, including uh, Indonesia. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So uh, before I hand over microphone to Mia, I was wondering whether Sion, Sion seems to be back and uh, I was wondering, uh, Sion, uh, uh, you know, somewhat related to uh, Haru's uh, uh, three uh, general points. Would you like to also wrap up your uh, presentation? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe five minutes? To, <laughs> sure. For five Thank minutes. you, Yasu. And then apologies to everybody. Somehow I got this message all of a sudden saying you know, critical error to my PC. <laughs> and it, it was a restarting. I, <laughs> So sorry about that. Um, and then uh, thank you again uh, for Yasu to step in. Um, there was a great, I, 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 I believe it was a great intervention. I got uh, really the final parts through my, uh, uh, my phone connection. Um, well, the, the book uh, does actually discuss, uh, in fact, uh, you know, these are uh, four broad areas, including the uh, adequate provision of regional public goods and then leveraging trade investment for inclusive growth, particularly through boosting intra-regional trade and then uh, FDI to raise participation uh, in global value chain. Uh, we have seen during the pandemic, uh, it is also uh, important to continue 
to uh, stay vigilant and safeguard against any financial instability through stronger financial cooperation. And I would like to uh, emphasize uh, for the renewed uh, efforts to build uh, smarter and better for post-COVID uh, Asia, uh, we need to strengthen the res resilience through various uh, uh, angles. And uh, the book actually features uh, four sets of the studies that uh, focus on how to build resilience through cooperation uh, during and after uh, COVID pandemic. In fact, uh, we have learned some important lessons. Some governments in the region exchange information and data on health surveillance, they share research results and have developed online uh, learning platforms for medical frontliners. Uh, in the medium term, we need to consider how to better manage supply chains for uh, personal protective equipment, medication, and vaccines. This can be done by supporting domestic manufacturing uh, and set up logistics and distribution system, especially now cold chain uh, appears to be the critical, and providing uh, trade finance support and digitizing supply networks. And for the long term, strengthening regulatory processes and standards for COVID products, health and safety protocols, and reinforcing national health systems will be critical. And the creation of regional financing facility for fighting pandemic and disasters might actually be a good step in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sinyoung, for a um, um, uh, very nice uh, wrapping up. Uh, so now I, I'd like to invite uh, Mia. And uh, um, I thought uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mia about um, uh, a specific question, uh, being as a director of uh, Trade Investment Innovation Division of UNSCAP. Uh, my uh, question is uh, uh, how, um, uh, you know, in the backdrop of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how can the region uh, of uh, trade and investment in Asia uh, how the uh, the region, Asian Pacific region, uh, gains of trade and investment um, uh, can be shared uh, more broadly and bring about more inclusive growth. And uh, actually, intriguingly, there is a first question in chat box, a related question. Uh, we want to want and deserve to fill up all sustainable uh, development goals. What we can we see policy makers uh, indifferent to their accountability. Sustainable development is. Uh, now global issue, which policy can remove all uh, corruptions also increasing uh, increasing regional uh, international strong strategy? Uh, probably, uh, uh, Mia, uh, it's a uh, floor is yours. You can uh, talk about uh, uh, how to enhance uh, inc inc inclusivity of uh, RCI and also uh, ultimately, um, uh, you know, uh, help achieve uh, SDGs. So Mia, floor is yours. Uh, uh, please spend five minutes or so. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yasu. And uh, I hope uh, uh, the video and the technology will continue working. Um, and uh, let me just start with thanking uh, you and uh, you know everyone involved for this uh, opportunity. It's really great. Uh, to be in the same virtual space uh, with uh, with all of you, and uh, and of course, ESCAP always appreciate the opportunity to be involved in this. Uh, and I especially welcome your question and also the you know linking it uh, to the participant question because the sustainable development goals uh, is something that uh, United Nations, of course, works uh, on. Uh, as a as a as a mandate uh, that is given by people uh, across the world to all of us to to work on, um, and uh, uh, you know I would like to start with pointing something very obvious, and maybe people will think it's too simplistic, but to actually uh, be able to share the gains from trade, you need to keep first markets and borders open for for trade to happen. So uh, this was uh, the, 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 uh, if we do the, the contrary, uh, as uh, it was demonstrated uh, through the previous uh, months of this crisis, uh, then the gains, the gains do not, did not appear. Uh, actually, the contrary uh, happens and there are many, uh, there are many uh, harms and, and costs that are invoked by keeping markets uh, and borders closed. I think the most um, 
you know, when, when we were starting to uh, enter into the first phase of, of COVID, uh, in addition to the, the uh, weakening functioning of the supply chains for the obvious reasons of the policies that were put in place uh, to deal with the health risks, uh, countries made such or governments uh, made situation worse by uh, starting to implement various export controls that prevent actually trade of very important essential goods and the access to those that most needed the, uh, uh, such goods uh, to, to having it. So I think uh, the gains to be assured, they need to first let being existed and that the, the condicio sine qua non there is really to keep uh, markets markets and borders uh, open. But let's let's understand that as a as a premise. So in in looking forward and keeping uh, our eyes um, uh, to to the post pandemic world, if you wish, we do need to be uh, informed by the pre COVID world uh, and the. Uh, and the outcomes of the globalization and hyperglobalization, if you, if you uh, want to really focus on the last decade of the pre uh, pre COVID uh, uh, growth or uh, phase, and so what what we had there was a tremendous growth, uh, but the 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 fruits of that growth were not shared. Uh, in indeed. Uh, in parallel to such great dynamism, uh, particularly in Asia, what we also had uh, is a very fast deepening of uh, inequalities. The, 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 the distribution uh, was increasingly getting skewed in favor of very few and at the cost of very many. Uh, on top of that, of course, we had some very clear direct damages to uh, environment, etc. I'm not in the interest of time going to go into, into this one. So how do we convert uh, this uh, into fairer, more just world and to link it to the question also, the world that would be dealing with uh, all these uh, other actually um, side products of deepening inequalities uh, that, uh, that sometimes are demonstrated in bribery, corruption, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, national populism uh, that, that Hal was uh, bringing in so, so eloquently. Uh, and I think uh, what, uh, what uh, VP Babang was, was uh, pointing to uh, is importance of institutions that need to exist uh, at the national level first and then of course uh, also at the regional and international or multilateral level so uh, it is very correct that we need to deal with national uh, first reforms etc that was very well pointed in the book as well and in so far this discuss discussions that um, that um, uh, uh, we heard. Uh, so, <clears throat> in the interest of time, let me move on the on the regional and and uh, uh, multilateral front. How to make these gains uh, uh, more shared is to really actively look at the factors that prevent the gains to be shared. So, in in the trade, being trade economists, we first look at the trade cost and and the rules of trade, right? So we need to cut the trade costs and we need to not only make rules of trade transparent, but we need to make them really simple and feasible to be met by the small and medium sized uh, companies, uh, the traders, uh, many of them uh, involve women so that they can actually actively engage in trade activities directly uh, or indirectly. Uh, and so many activities in trade facilitation uh, that we know of are related to cutting costs, right? And sometimes you do have vested interest in the countries that actually slow down implementation of these activities. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there is a 
uh, discussion to be had on that. But if we transparently point to the potential benefits of uh, reaching and 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 you know removing those uh, those barriers through the vested interest and putting in place activities like paperless trade, uh, digital trade processes, uh, really. Uh, uh, some countries were somehow miraculously managed to do it in the times of pandemic when it was really uh, very important. And so now what remains to be done is to make these permanent changes and to stay in place so that uh, the, you know, the benefits uh, continue rolling uh, through uh, for uh, through these smoother and, uh, and uh, better uh, customs procedures and trade facilitation. In this context, I'm, I'm also, if you allow me, very, very happy to announce that uh, the, the uh, treaty, UN treaty on uh, cross-border paperless trade will uh, be put in force on the 20th of February, 2021, because now we have sufficient number of countries that ratify that agreement and implementation of that agreement will go uh, a long way in helping countries in the region, particularly those that uh, grapple with digital trade uh, to, to actually improve uh, cutting the cost, etc. Uh, if you allow me another minute, Yasu, I know that I'm testing uh, my, my time. I would like to- uh, Yes, please go ahead, yes. please. I would like to point also to, uh, you know, the other sorts of benefits that uh, international trade can bring. Uh, and this is an area not necessarily in manufacturing good, but also in combining uh, the digital technology and services. And so we have seen, uh, you know, the, the, the benefits of remote work for, for all of us, right? That can be taken to the much larger scale, to the world scale. You know, we, have, uh, we, we are aware of, uh, of uh, ability for services to be actually provided anytime through the platforms. And uh, the reason I'm bringing that up is that it will achieve two effects. One, it will complement or substitute uh, increasingly difficult physical mobility of professionals around the world for many reasons uh, we can't go into them now. But also, and, and, and for that, you know uh, what what will happen is that uh, the the professionals like women will be able to get to the to the uh, to the platform and provide the services and not be challenged because of their gender or uh, or nationality etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, there is a, a great equalizing element in uh, in that by opening the services provision uh, um, to through the digital platforms. For that, we need to work uh, much more on, uh, on cooperative uh, arrangements for the data flows, because what is uh, obstruction in that is really uh, the, uh, the uh, non-existent or, or very weak arrangements in that. And so this is one element for regional cooperation that, um, that remains to be strengthened. Uh, and and I think one element that will definitely definitely uh, improve the benefits from uh, all sorts of uh, trade uh, that that happens not necessarily in manufacturing trade but also in 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 uh, services and as well as the exchange of ideas and um, and knowledge. So let me uh, uh, let me. Uh, I think uh, stop here because uh, I think I have exhausted my allocated time and I'll be happy to bring in some particulars later on if possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mia. Um, I, I think your message was very clear. Uh, not only simply open up uh, national border, but uh, also uh, uh, I think governments and also uh, 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 hold the uh, international uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, stakeholders should uh, more proactively facilitate uh, uh, trade so that the poor and the, uh, small scale micro MSMEs can again out of the uh, trade. And also digital role, digital is very, very critical uh, in this uh, current uh, uh, unusual uh, situation. And um, I think, uh, 
um, um, yeah, we see uh, e-commerce e and uh, work from home and also um, um, uh, virtual classrooms. Uh, these are new uh, modality. So I think um, how to um, facilitate the gains out of this uh, digital uh, platform. Um, um, uh, on the other hand, caring about cyber security and data privacy issues. So I think uh, these are very, very important uh, points for regional cooperation integration. So now I'd like to invite um, uh, Ji Kyung. Um, um, so my question to Ji Kyung is somewhat related to um, uh, Mia's uh, last point. Uh, in order to fully grasp benefits of regional cooperation, uh, policymakers need to transform uh, common regional vision into action. Uh, for this leadership and uh, innovation, uh, including a digital, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, platform, uh, fundamental, I think. So, uh, in your experience, especially your immediate experience as the president of AIM, in engaging education leaders, especially the private sectors, uh, what is the role, role of leadership in regional cooperation? How can uh, we go uh, from administrative agreements? Um, um, into a shared vision for regional cooperation. So any, uh, your thoughts on this uh, broader uh, role of leadership and innovation? So ji the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think this question of what would be the role of leadership in regional cooperation is indeed a very critical one. Essentially, what we need to think about is how can we go from administrative agreements and conventions to a shared vision for regional cooperation. I believe in order for us to have more practical tools in regional cooperation, we must appreciate the fact that critical role the leadership plays in being a catalyst for innovation within the region. For example, um, part one of this book talks about promotion of regional public goods, but also stresses how such provision is a voluntary. In fact, a regional leadership is absolutely necessary to ensure international cooperation, enforcement of commitments and monitoring of violations of uh, any kind of corporate agreements. I think most of us would agree that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted even further, the need for different countries to cooperate in the provision of vital regional public goods, um, such as those related to disease prevention, containment, and support for vulnerable and at-risk groups, uh, migrant workers, the poor, the youth, the women, agricultural workers, et cetera, et cetera, as well as a facilitation of regional economic recovery. So for example, a country whose neighbor or major trading partner continues to experience high rates of infection will not be able to isolate itself by completely shutting down all international exchanges for an extended period of time. We learned that the coordinated the regional response to the pandemic is therefore essential to ensure lasting success in, uh, in, in fighting COVID-19, for example. Indeed, successful regional cooperation in providing regional public goods should start at home. In other words, the translation of administrative agreement and conventions into a more practical tools of regional cooperation is uh, very much contingent upon the capacity of participating countries to provide public goods nationally as well as locally. Obviously, countries, institutions, uh, political organizations, and priorities strongly influence its contribution to international public goods provisions. A success or failure in addressing these issues locally will affect the legitimacy of any regional leadership that national local leaders seek to exercise. In fact, I believe the capacity to supply regional public goods is indeed an extension of a country's own capacity to provide the national public goods. Simply put, countries cannot expect it to provide the public goods to share with their neighbors if they do not have capacity and, and clear leadership to provide public goods to their own citizens. It's also contingent on the willingness as well as ability of national leaders to recognize the most pressing challenges and socioeconomic issues of our time. Um, and, and they do not respect uh, uh, borderless uh, issues, regardless uh, of the fact that whether we're dealing with whether it's a pandemic, poverty, abuse, human traffic, 
uh, environmental degradation, climate change, and so on and so forth. Um, yes, uh, politicians and policymakers play an important role in forging formal regional cooperation, but the real work happens at the level of organizations, businesses, uh, private sector, obviously, SMEs, professionals, and in fact, individual citizens working together toward the shared goals. We need leaders at all levels of private and public sectors to think in terms of interrelationships and interdependencies and to aim for win-win solutions rather than beggar died neighbors approaches to solving the challenges of our time. Now, part four of the book talks about building resilience amidst the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And I think this is another responsibility of leaders at all levels. It's about building cooperation among different countries in the region, um, whether it's creating low carbon future or whether it's uh, creating international carbon markets. I think while reading this part of the book, one line that struck me was that different parts of Asia and the Pacific are predicted to be hotspots for emerging disease. Um, but it's not surprising given the region's climate, population density, and the poverty in a lot of parts of Southeast Asia. Another thing that struck me was the threat of climate change, which increased the threat of outbreaks, occurrence of coastal flooding, um, several areas of disasters uh, throughout the region. In fact, as many of you know, just recently, Metro Manila and neighboring provinces experienced massive flooding uh, during the recent typhoon. We uh, at the Asian Institute of Management understand uh, this critical importance of building resilience for build, uh, businesses and societies to build the prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable Asian business societies we believe we must create and safer and more resilient organizations and communities. We also believe uh, building and strengthening disaster resilience requires systematic, multidimensional, and collaborative approach that goes beyond the borders. And this is why we offer programs such as Executive Master in Disaster Risk and Crisis Management to develop leaders who can adapt to dynamic conditions lead diverse teams in a complex and, and even more complex situations as days go by and um, who can efficiently effectively address uh, pressing issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ji Kyung, uh, for a very nice um, uh, um, intervention highlighting uh, um, uh, concerted policy actions are uh, necessary uh, in putting efforts, uh, building capacity, and also supporting the uh, weakest link uh, contributors as well as the uh, vulnerable people. So I think uh, this is very important. And also, um, uh, as you uh, nicely touch upon, uh, yes, I'm also sitting in the Metro Manila. We hit by a very serious typhoon, and the eastern part uh, really um, uh, mm -hmm. en encountered uh, serious uh, floods. And uh, so this is a uh, um, um, you know, already happening. Another uh, another big one is already happening. So I think um, uh, this is a nice segue to um, 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 uh, Ronnie um, about um, you know we are uh, trying to uh, put our efforts to contain a uh, spread of the pandemic. Uh, but um, uh, in, in this uh, short term uh, action, I think a medium and long term responses will also be necessary uh, to um, uh, prepare. Uh, for the next pandemic or other crises. And indeed, uh, already uh, uh, Metro Manila was hit by another one. H how can regional cooperation contribute to build the resilience against the health and more in general disaster or climate change risks be beyond this uh, short term uh, uh, you know, response? Uh, what's a medium and long term um, regional cooperation contribution? So Ronnie, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Sawada uh, for your uh introduction and the opportunity to be part of this panel. And good day to all the participants. Uh, it's a pleasure for me in this, to be in the same panel as uh, Dr. Mikik, uh, Professor Hill, Dr. Kang, who I believe are also strong believers in RCI. I would also like to congratulate Vice President Susan Tono and Director Park for producing a timely and relevant publication on the future of RCI. 
uh, regional cooperation is indeed very important to ADB as it is a strategic mandate that emanates from no less than our very own charter. Before responding to your question, Dr. Sawada, let me first emphasize that the four themes that uh, was highlighted in the book are indeed relevant and should be taken into account in all our future RCI operations. I must say that the recent trends in our operations are quite encouraging. Operations in RCI supporting environmentally sustainable growth, for example, have really expanded from only 12 projects amounting to $1.3 billion in 2013 to 22 projects totaling $4.4 billion in 2019. However, uh, we do recognize the need to place increasing emphasis on regional public goods, particularly on health security, which is the question at hand. The book that is being launched today correctly pointed out, and I quote, that the shutdown of international borders and the unprecedented disruption to global supply chains as a result of COVID-19 pandemic show how any semblance of normal trade, population movement, and regional cooperation can exist only when there is a certain level of health security. Thus, regional cooperation could contribute to building medium to long-term resilience against health security risks by opening up opportunities to draw on the health leadership of participating countries, their human resource skills, and experience to address common health challenges. Such is indeed the case in the Greater Mekong Subregion or GMS Economic Cooperation Program, our flagship subregional program that we support, which is implementing a GMS health cooperation strategy. This strategy focuses on improving health system performance in responding to public health threats strengthening protection for vulnerable communities from the health impacts of regional integration and enhancing human resource capacity to respond to priority health issues. In addition, the new 2030 strategy of the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation or CAREC program, another sub-regional program that we are supporting includes health as an operational priority to help member countries address pandemic risks, control communicable diseases, and reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases. In the Pacific, a regional approach for the purchase and distribution of health-related goods and services is warranted as the procurement and delivery of vaccines could be costly due to small market and population size and the country's distance from suppliers, which increase the cost of transport and cold storage. Indeed, regional cooperation is very important. Here, uh, Dr. Sawada, the, you can see that some regional platforms such as GMS, CAREC, and the one we have in the Pacific, they all bring together senior government officials and development partners to strengthen the effectiveness of public health from a cross-border perspective. And they also help align or harmonize country policy, regulations, and practices. In case of mitigating disaster and climate change risks, we all know that these are governed by international commitments, which I believe regional cooperation platforms should be able to help implement. For example, this new strategy of the GMS program, which is expected to be endorsed by the leaders in March next year, uh, will support and mainstream climate and disaster risk resilience elements into their operations, both as purely climate and disaster risk resilience projects or as part of infrastructure connectivity projects. Thank you, Dr. Tawada. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronnie, for uh, highlighting also sub-regional uh, programs such as GMS and CAREC. And indeed, uh, GMS, we already, you know, ADB has been supporting uh, GMS more than 25 years. And uh, indeed, uh, GMS already had uh, uh, some uh, cross-border health, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, health um, uh, uh, program. So that was very, very useful and effective to tackle COVID-19 situation. So I think uh, uh, preparing um, the uh, pandemic and disaster and climate change, that's really uh, important. Thank you, thank you very much. So now, uh, because the time is running out, I'd like to uh, invite uh, uh, each panelist um, uh, one minute um, um, in a re reverse order, uh, starting from uh, Ronnie. Um, the question is uh, uh, simply, um, so what we should do, what's the role of the regional cooperation in the economic or broader social recovery in the post COVID-19 era? And also, um, there are two most popular questions in Q and A, uh, saying that uh, um, uh, would be great, great here about the role of private sector and civil society in strengthening RC, RCI, and um, uh, also another uh, popular question is uh, uh, who are the winners and the losers uh, uh, in the past? Uh, uh, what game-changing institutional reforms are needed to ensure post-COVID Asian regionalism? In more inclusive, more sustainable, more resilient, and avoid government risk. So my uh, simple question is, uh, what should be done, or what can be done in um, um, recovery, uh, aiming at the recovery from a po post COVID nineteen, um, uh, either a role of government or international organization, uh, uh, private sector, or even civil society. So from any angle, please uh, uh, spend your one minute. Uh, 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 each panelist. So, uh, Ronnie, uh, let's start from you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sawada. Very simple. I think the publication launched this year, Asia's Journey to Prosperity, Policy, Market, and Technology over 50 years, clearly spelled out how to do it based on RCI frameworks that we have done in the past. Promote trade and investment, infrastructure connectivity, and regional public goods. On uh, trade and investment, VP Susantono in his op-ed of 24 November said that trade has been a key tool in fighting COVID-19 and looking ahead, it will be vital for economic recovery. And for that to happen, trade investment liberalization and facilitating trade through sub-regional initiatives and plurilateral agreements such as the RCEP are expected to drive open regionalism. Second, we need to pursue the unfinished agenda on greater and high, high quality regional connectivity and logistics, which incorporates components that make it safe, efficient, and resilient to disasters. Priority regional investments in CARIC, GMS, and SASEC amount to about $160 billion over the next three to five years. This is substantial. And third, we need to accelerate actions on regional public goods, which was emphasized in the book. I need not say more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie. So now, uh, Ji Kyung, um, please. Thank you. Um, I think the regional networks of infrastructure, whether it's physical, digital, social, I think that's absolutely essential for countries uh, to recover and to pursue inclusive growth through trade and investment. This infrastructure will facilitate the exchange of goods, services, information, and even ideas, and can reduce the development gap amongst Asian economies, uh, but also within them. Many key developmental and social challenges we face in terms of public uh, goods provision, health, security, protection of human rights, uh, poverty, systematic inequality environment, all of those uh, issues, I think, all, all very relevant. And we must accept that virtually all of these are not limited by national borders. Uh, a single country or economy acting alone will not be able to solve these problems. Uh, as countries begin to realize that the new normal may include a COVID-19, but there might be other similar kind of uh, challenges we face, and there will remain a constant threat. Governments uh, and their citizens will have to embrace I think much more proactive coping strategies on top of general preventive strategies aimed at building general resistance from this kind of disasters. 
I think we need a proactive strategies that will improve the conditions of individuals as well as organizations. So as to offset, eliminate, reduce, modify crisis and their impacts. So we can um, a, a strike back and uh, uh, prevent us from um, going down with the dangers that present uh, significantly uh, diminished. All in all, um, I strongly believe that regional cooperation should focus on addressing uh, vulnerable groups uh, and supporting them, and, and many of which uh, pandemic has exposed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ji Kyung. Uh, Mia, uh, your uh, uh, comment? One minute, and yes, you, have one minute. Actually, you have actually <laughs> given us a task that would require a, a semester, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but let, me, let me just build on what uh, Chi Kyung said uh, uh, about proactive seeking of regional cooperation. I want to underscore that the weak cooperation is not, uh, is not in a, uh, inevitability, it is a choice. And so the governments have actually to, to uh, choose to cooperate. Uh, from the perspective of uh, re in international institutions uh, that I work for, uh, UN provides a platform for such cooperation. And it, uh, it really uh, is uh, aiming to rebuilding uh, the confidence of countries to really reconfirming their trust in each other that they can keep borders open and markets open because there will be solidarity and there will be joint action that will help all. So I think uh, because we have weakened multilateral institutions uh, considerably uh, in recent years. Uh, if we strengthen this re uh, cooperation at the regional level, we will be able to underpin a uh, return of the stronger multilateralism that will be absolutely necessary in dealing with recovery and uh, uh, pandemic in terms of uh, putting vaccine uh, to be affordable and accessible uh, to all population. So let me stop there and thank you for the opportunity to uh, voice uh, our opinion and position. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mia. Uh, Har, for uh, yours. Thank you, Yasu. So I know time is very tight. Many issues to think about and <laughs> in a couple, one or, one or two minutes. Let me focus on one, the most recent practical manifestation of RCI which uh, for Asia Pacific, which is of course RCEP, the recent signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, since it, it picks up a lot of the general issues which are being raised in the Q and A and chat. Uh, I think I think we'd all agree RCEP is very welcome. Uh, it's ASEAN centred, which I think is an advantage. For the first time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it includes the three major economies of Northeast Asia who've signed an agreement like this, or part of, parties to an agreement like this. Uh, I think it's best if it's in the spirit of what Jagdish Bhagwati always used to call uh, open regionalism. Yep. Uh, and that includes specifically, I guess, getting, getting uh, India, for example, into the tent. Just to note that RCEP very, is very welcome, but there are still quite a lot of thorny issues to be worked through. Uh, one is services trade, uh, FDI, procurement, a lot else, which I haven't read all the fine print, but I don't think they're in there significantly. Services trade in particular is a complex issue because it often involves the movement of people across uh, international boundaries to deliver or receive the service. And even, with, even beyond COVID, it's going to be a tricky issue. Uh, then, then it does link to the other major regional trade initiative on the table, the TPP or now called the CPPP, uh, and whether in particular the US might re rejoin that, uh, which would potentially be a game changer. And final point, standing back from all this is the famous or the infamous spaghetti bowl. That is the lines crossing the global map of bilateral and regional agreements. Just to put ourselves for a moment in the position of a trader or investor contemplating some bilateral transactions from country A to country B, in many cases, these potential traders or investors would have up to three or four uh, agreements they could actually conduct uh, under the auspices they could conduct their business. And I think when you talk to business people, that is a significant issue for them to think about. 
which of the of the two, three, even four agreements which potentially they could operate under are the ones they should operate under. I think this issue, it's been around a long time, Spaghetti Bowl, but I think it's becoming ever more pressing and urgent. But just And just to note the other final point that uh, let's not forget that global production networks, uh, basic, which are about half of intra East Asian and intra ASEAN trade, are essentially free trade for, for merchandise trade because under the ITA. So I think our set very welcome, but there's a lot of thinking to be done about how it fits into this pretty complex uh, regional uh, architecture. Uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate. I've enjoyed it a lot. And congratulations again to Pat Bambang, Sin Yang, and the contributors. Thank you, Yasu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hao. And uh, thank you again for all the panelists for this uh, very lively and exciting uh, discussions. Uh, three uh, uh, very short uh, uh, points. Uh, first, uh, we affirm the strong uh, regional cooperation is uh, indispensable, um, uh, especially in um, a COVID-19 uh, uh, recovery. Secondly, regional cooperation requires by nature uh, concerted policy actions, but uh, these policy actions should be shared and also uh, so that uh, no one left behind. So this is a very important point uh, um, highlighted by all the panelists. Thirdly, the next phase of regional cooperation invite us to uh, regroup or rebuild uh, our region for a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable future. As I mentioned by Hao and uh, Mia, uh, RCEP uh, uh, and uh, CPTPP um, uh, will be a very important uh, stepping stone, bridging block for a more global open economic system. So I think uh, we should support and we should support, uh, facilitate this uh, uh, trend in uh, COVID-19 recovery. So uh, let me conclude by thank thanking again all the panelists today uh, to this um, uh, book launching event. Uh, this book is now available on the ADB website. And uh, I think a link is on the screen as well as in the chat box Q&A uh, box. Uh, we hope the book will be a very rich source of uh, insights for scholars, policymakers, and anyone interested in Asian cooperation and uh, integration. Uh, before closing, um, uh, I think we will put, um, so this is the book uh, link. And then, so this is the next uh, uh, webinar. So we will have a webinar uh, titled, What Will uh, Drive Innovation in Post-COVID-19 uh, Asia? And um, uh, Thursday next week, um, uh, December 3rd from uh, 4 p.m. Manila time. So thank you, thank you very much. And um, again, please join me to thank all the presenters and the panelists for a very, very lively and uh, fascinating uh, discussion.